I um, wrote a book that came out a little while back called Enterprise 2.0. And I guess it's time for a shameless plug. If you'd like a copy of it, they're available. I'm signing them in the tent at 6.15 this afternoon. I think you'd better hurry up and buy it, though, because it's evidently um, very soon to be obsolete. <laughs> so um, we dealt with the first round of enterprises for a few hundred years. And in the wake of Web 2.0, we started talking about Enterprise 2.0, which came out in late 2009. And evidently, the um, uh, the clock speed in this world is increasing because we're already on to Enterprise 3.0 just a few months later. So what we want to talk about in this panel is what is this beast? What do we mean when we talk about Enterprise 3.0 and Web 3.0? If the definitions have not calmed down in the 2.0 world yet, and they haven't, they certainly haven't calmed down in the 3.0 world yet. So we want to try to get our arms around what this phenomenon is by listening to our panelists talk about their vision for enterprise and or web 3.0, and then dive into what we're seeing, what we're learning, what the benefits are, what the challenges have been. And I'm going to lead a discussion among the panelists for about the first 45 minutes. We want to leave plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end, though. So please, if anything that we say sparks a comment or a question, come up, take one of the microphones. We'll have plenty of time at the end to talk about it. Rather than me butchering names, though, what I'd like to do is get each of our panelists to introduce themselves, talk about their work and their organizations just a bit. So Ed, can I ask you to start? Sure. Um, my name is Ed Curry, um, and I will be signing copies of Enterprise 3.0 at 7.45 in the tent. <laughs> um, I'm a, an e-business researcher at the Digital Enterprise Research Institute, also known as Derry. Um, and at Derry, we are the, uh, the leading web science research organization in the world. Um, we are funded by Science Foundation Ireland and the European Union. And we also receive funding from industrial backers as well. Um, what we do with, uh, what we try to do at Derry is we, we look at how enterprises are going to change when they use information, what impacts enterprises when, when they're trying to utilize, share, reuse information, and how that effectively can affect their business for competitive advantage and for operations. Um, specifically, what I look at is the web of data, a new emerging platform that's happening now on the web where companies are starting to share their data using a technology known as linked data technology. Um, specifically, I've been looking at companies over the last two years, I've looked at 60 companies that have started to use this technology inside their firewalls to start to share their information internally. And I've looked at how that has impacted them and what that means for their organization, and what it means for their employees, and also what it means for their business. Um, so hopefully I, I should have some insights to share about that over the next um, hour, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Great. Greg? Uh, so my name is Greg Hansen. I'm VP of Application Development and Data Warehousing for uh, Advanced Micro Devices. Um, AMD is, is one of the two microprocessor manufacturers that, that power the, the graphic, or power the processors in all our desktop and notebook computers and servers. Um, we're the only manufacturer that ties together both graphics and the CPU and chipset into a single solution. Um, AMD had a, had a very interesting year last year, um, and things look much, much better this year. We've, uh, we've just released a, a, a very powerful set of server chips that are powering, when you hear companies talk about the cloud, utility computing, private clouds. Um, we've got a server solution um, because of our virtualization technology that yields the best price per performance. Um, looking out over the next year, and this is actually relevant to this conversation because it's, uh, it's not just a sales pitch. Um, because it, it if I plug a book, you can plug your chips. Okay. I think that's okay. the ground rule. I just can't sign chips. <laughs> um, Looking out over the, the, the coming year, uh, we're going to re release a new chip. Um, it's our accelerated, pro accelerated processing unit. It's a fused chip between graphics and CPU on a single chip. And it enables a new level of accelerated computing in a client that, honestly, we've just never seen before. And if you look at the intersection of that type of power in a client with the consumerization of IT, where you're seeing iPads enter the firewall, and you're seeing a, a proliferation of mobile devices, and you're seeing, more importantly, 
you're seeing workloads and use cases that are relevant in, on the outside in Web 2.0 moving into the enterprise. I'll, I'll be honest, we just don't know what's going to happen when this level of power hits the notebook and then comes inside the firewall. Excellent. Hello, I'm Gene Rogers from the Clearway Companies, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I think perspective about the speakers is very important, so I'm going to just share a little bit of my background. I promise not to do too many shameless plugs, but uh, I started my career on, on your side of the table. I was a CIO, a CFO, a COO, and, and a number of companies. And, and having those uh, varied perspectives with IT as part of my uh, arsenal and my quiver was really valuable to me, and, and it helped me to empower my companies to improve productivity and innovation and accelerate business processes and, and do all of those things that we all strive to do. And, and about 13 years ago, after doing that uh, in industry for about 25 years, I decided to branch out and see if that skill set would be valuable to, to other companies, and I started the Clearway companies. And Clearway started as a professional services company focused on uh, some of the, the foundational elements of Enterprise 2.0, enterprise workflow, uh, systems connectivity, uh, and, uh, and, and the company took off like a rocket ship, improving business processes and accelerating uh, uh, processes was uh, something very valuable to our clients. We branched into other things, into what was the enterprise portal space around 1999. We became a, 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 a Microsoft partner working with them with SharePoint, another collaborative platform that, again, embraces some of the enterprise uh, 2.0 mantra. And along the way, we started developing our own intellectual property and software, and we ended up spinning out three different software companies. We have Clearway Network Management Solutions, which provides telcos and service providers with end-to-end -end network management from their core network all the way through to the, the VoIP phone in your office. So if you're experiencing a problem, they can correlate what's going on not only in their network and their core network, but across the public internet and through your site to find out what's causing that problem. And it's something that's uh, uh, met with great receptivity and it, it's doing quite well with our, our clients. The second one, uh, you know, it's funny, I, I, I'm the small company perspective here. Clearway is probably the smallest organization represented here, certainly compared to AMD. I know we're much smaller. Uh, but I'll probably make some bold statements about what we're doing. And uh, the, the other uh, software company, the next software company, is Clearway Software, or Clearway Security, I'm sorry. And uh, we'll be bringing a product to market in the next couple of months that will make SQL injection attacks a thing of the past. We have proven in extensive testing that we can prevent 100% of SQL injection attacks. And, so that's something that's probably of interest to everyone here, and, and we can probably even talk yeah, about offline. Sure. And, and it's interesting. I've never met these panelists before, so this is great. We'll get to know each other up here. And then the final company uh, that I'll talk about is Clearway Insight, and that's probably the reason I was invited to speak here today. And, and Clearway uh, Insight, we believe, will bring disruptive innovation to the market space in the areas of Enterprise 3.0 and Web 3.0. And, and we'll get into what that means as part of our discussion, and I'll, I'll pass it on. My name is Ralph Swick. I'm Chief Operating Officer of W3C, which is a worldwide web consortium. Um, that's a new role for me. I'm a computer scientist, uh, IT uh, technology developer uh, for, for a long time. The web is 20 years old. Can you imagine that? Uh, some, of you, some of you in the room, I think, uh, maybe don't remember the time before the web, but, but most of us do. Um, <laughs> Uh, Tim Berners-Lee uh, wrote the original proposal, talk about innovation and common platforms for doing innovation. Tim Berners-Lee wrote that original proposal for the web in 1989, and in 1990 created the first uh, uh, specification for the markup language that's used on the web. So uh, 1990 to today is going to be 20 years this fall. Um, four years after that, in 1994, he was invited to create uh, uh, an industry consortium to manage the, the development of the, uh, of the interoperable standards for the web, and that's who W3C is. Tim still is the director of the web. I joined W3C in, uh, in 1997 to work in areas of uh, privacy, uh, and, um, uh, and that quickly uh, uh, turned into work on what we then called uh, metadata, and uh, is now known as a semantic web or, or the linked web of linked data, which we'll, we'll talk about a lot, uh, a lot this afternoon. So uh, while uh, uh, Andy suggested the, the pace of things, 
uh, is picking up. Uh, from my perspective, we started, well, uh, the web is 20 years old. Tim's original vision for the web included all the interactivity. People were supposed to be able to write to the web as easily as they could read to, from the web. Well, that became what some people called Web 2.0, mm -hmm. <laughs> when you could actually write to the web, and wikis and uh, things of, uh, of that sort are, are considered to be features of Web 2.0. And um, Tim's uh, 1989 version of the web also included mechanisms for linking data together more than just providing a hypertext link, not just clicking on a link to go from one document to another, but actually describing uh, other kinds of data and, uh, and linking that data together. And uh, uh, 12 years ago, I, I helped publish the first specification for linking data on the web, and here we are still about to see it deployed. So, so if Web 3.0 or Enterprise 3.0 represents the achievement of that 20-year-old vision, then I can say I'm glad the pace of progress is, is picking up, but it's still much slower than I, than I would like to see. Yeah. And we want to dive into that issue of, of why has the pace for some parts of the web been fantastic and in many ways quicker than we were anticipating, and why in other areas are we still 12 years later about to see it deployed? It's, it seems like a deep puzzle here. Before we dive into that, though, could I ask each of you to articulate your, your definition and or your vision for what either Web 3.0 or Enterprise 3.0 is. Because like we said earlier, this is fuzzy in the minds of a lot of people, myself included, certainly. So w when you talk about this 3.0 phenomenon, what are you talking about? And we'll pick on you first again, Ed. OK. Um, I suppose when, when I look at Enterprise 3.0 or Web 3.0, what, what we're looking to do is to try to break down the barriers to sharing and reusing our data. So I, I think the first few sessions. I'm going to stop you right there. That's exactly what I was trying to do with Enterprise 2.0. What did I get wrong? What did I leave out? What you focused on was documents. You, like you didn't focus on data. And that's not your fault, because Tim's vision goes right back to, to documents and data. And both documents and data are vital to an enterprise. We, we, we listened to our panelists this morning talk about how we need to leverage our data for competitive advantage, how we need to have data-driven enterprises, how we need to be using analytics and to compete on analytics. And everyone talks about this wonderful future of data. And what we really have is we, we think people think data comes from one source, from one well. But the problem actually is when you go into your enterprises and you see the reality, it's more like this. There's hundreds of silos all over the place. With data, There's a beautiful image and everything. of the data architecture of any medium size or big organization right absolutely, there. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and people. We did that just for this panel, I want you to know. <laughs> special order, special order. But like, this is what the, the reality that we're faced with here. We're talking about creating standardized ways of, of, of working with our data. Let's get a group together and create a standard. And, the IT department are tasked with this, and they come along and they say, OK, we're going to have one ERP system and one billing system, and we're going to have you know, a project to bring all these together. It takes two years. But while, while that's been going on, the CEO has been busy. He's bought four companies. So next one, you say, well, I know I have four billing systems, and I have four HR systems. So you get a new project together. Let's install a big system like SAP. <laughs> Wonderful. That takes $20 million in four years. And he's bought another 25 companies. So meanwhile, while we're, getting, while we're trying to consolidate some of those organ pipes, new ones keep appearing all Absolutely. the time. Absolutely. So there's a, there's a fundamental rethinking, a fundamental shift in the way that we look at data and look at trying to integrate data. We need to stop trying to integrate our enterprise systems and look to start integrating our enterprise data. And to me, that, that's the key shift for, for Web 3.0 and, and, and for Enterprise 3.0. So I'm going to dive in on that just a little bit more. Stick with our organ pipe. Sure. Uh, imagery over there. What are we going to do differently to make all those pipes start talking to each other? Sure. What we're going to do is we're going to start making our data easier to work with. Okay. So the barriers to information flow, when we started investigating um, the inter information flows in companies, we came across three consistent barriers to information flow. And the, the, these have existed with documents 20 years ago, and, and the web helped solve that. The first one is that you need to make your data available. If I have permission to access a data set, I've got clearance from the security department yep. to do that. I need to be able to get to that data. The problem at the moment is that for me to get to this data, I normally need to work through a central reporting function or a central IT function. So that, that's the first barrier. That's a cultural barrier. Make data available to your employees. Yep. The second barrier is, well, you need to make it easy to access the data. Yep. If I need to learn a different technology for each one of these stovepipes, you know, I'm just a regular user. I, I, I'm not going to go off to MIT and 
and learn about all these different technologies. I need to be able to get that technology, sorry, that data to me very, very simply. And that is something that the web has done with documents. 20 years ago, there was no concept of a, a HTTP name that could literally pull you back a document from anywhere in the world. We had different technologies, different protocols, different formats for documents. The web has unified that together. We need to do that for data. Yep. And the third thing, and the most critical thing, is when we, when we actually access this data and pull it back using a, a standard protocol, we also get relationships to other data. So if I'm pulling back information on, on a customer, I should be getting back information on, on, on what the customer name is, what products they've purchased from us, but I also need to be getting relationships to other data that's linked to that. So if the customer has a technical support issue, I should be seeing that one as well. If the customer has new requirements or has recently acquired a company, I, I need to start seeing that data. And that data should kind of come along in the wake of the data that I initially pull. Absolutely. So the, the best analogy I can possibly think of here is that what we're looking to do with data is what we've already done with documents. Um, we, we make it easy to access them, uh, we, we, we make them available, and we also add related um, information. So if you think of looking at Wikipedia, if you look at a particular article for a particular person, you get loads of links to additional information that gives you a wider context. We need to be doing that for our data inside our enterprises. Yeah, I was just going to say one other thing that goes hand in hand with what you're saying is, is of course, you have to have uh, easy access to that data. But one thing that's very important about that is taking a, maybe a step before that is storing data. We're still storing data on personal computers the same way we did 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. We have a directory. We have a one-to-one -one relationship. We have a folder. We can put data in there, and then it's related to that folder. We can't do a many-to-many -many information relationship yet. And, and that's something that fundamentally we're going to challenge with the Clearway Insight uh, product because uh, we believe that you have to be able to relate, as you said earlier, uh, one set of information to another. And assuming that you have a permission to that data, you should be able to just go into your folder, easily find that, find everything that's related to it, whether it came from a CRM system, an ERP system, your email system, uh, your file store on your laptop, or wherever it might have been. And, and that's next to impossible to do today. And uh, we think we can help change that. But it sounds like you're largely in line with the vision that oh, Ed just articulated. Absolutely. OK, Gene, Ralph, you guys want to add, debate, or refine yeah. our, our But it doesn't necessarily definition. mean moving the data either, although in some cases, I mean, maybe it doesn't. It, the corporate assets maybe don't want to live on personal computers, you know, although. But, but, but that's not the key feature. We don't, the, the reaction to protecting the corporate assets was to create data warehouses and pull everything mm -hmm. central. Well, that's really not what we're talking about here. Whether that's good or bad, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a data warehouse is just a massive consolidation effort. Centralized. Put it in one effect. great big database right. over here, exactly. which is not what we're talking about. That's, that's in some sense orthogonal to, to what, what, I, what I want to talk about. Uh, which is really opening access to that data. So in some of the earlier panels we talked about, uh, I think Fran Frank Moss mentioned uh, the notion of serendipitous invention. We want to open access to the data. So I don't know, this, this interesting organ pipe metaphor. Um, data goes in one end of a pipe and gets processed and comes out the other end. And the only thing the user can do with it is what comes out the other end. It's the one thing that that processing pipeline was meant to do with that data. You get the results out. And now how do we combine that? Well. Um, the notion of opening the data is, is to make it possible for the, um, uh, the invention of new things to do with that data, new ways to combine it, make new discoveries, because, because I took the data from one place in the organization, the data from another place in the organization, and, and smooshed them together. Um, and the technologies will make it easier to do that sort of thing. Um, so it's really opening, opening the access to that, to that data. And, and as, um, as Ann Margal said in the, in the previous panel, uh, efforts to do that in the government space have shown, have, have shown uh, real, real results in the kinds of innovative applications that the organization didn't have to build itself, other, others built. As I've listened to talk about the semantic web, I get confused sometimes whether we're talking about making it easier for people to grab four of those organ pipes, mash them together, and gain some insight from that, or if we're actually going as far as making it easier for those organ pipes to find each other and mash themselves up. Is, is, my, is my distinction clear? Uh, yes, and that's a, and, and that's a, I would say that's a marketing problem that, that the semantic web evangelists created for themselves. Okay. Um, if the long term, you know, if the 40 year vision is the organ pipes somehow manage to arrange themselves in the, to create a pleasant melody without direct human, without as much direct human, that, that's the dream that some people envision. 
but 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 we're taking we're taking smaller steps Fine. to get there. And the step we're taking right now is what we're calling linked data or linked open data, just just to just to make that data available with all appropriate access controls, et cetera. So let's just, right, so we're all going to assume data. the security problem away, even though it's a really evil it, problem. If you've got the mind. permissions, you get to mash it together and good stuff comes out of that. Okay. I'll, I'll be honest, what I'm hearing, and maybe this is because I am a part-time data warehouse guy, it's part of my responsibility, this does sound like data warehousing to me. Um, it, it, when, I, when I hear what you're describing, I think of a big data warehouse. Now, obviously, you can have multiple implementations of a data warehouse. Um, but I just think of data warehousing and specifically search as one of the enablers of what I think Enterprise 3.0 is. And I'll be honest, I'm still wrapping my head around what Enterprise 2.0 is. And you know, I, I feel like... We're battling Enterprise 2.0 on multiple fronts. Okay, thanks. <laughs> is, it, is it signed? Is it signed? Clear that right okay, here, You can have it back. <laughs> um, so to the degree that, that Enterprise 3.0 is the, is the logical evolution of what we're doing okay. in Enterprise 2.0, which is kind of the way I think of it, is in, in Enterprise 2.0, we're, we're starting to, to think differently about connections and conversations and how do, how do you connect the collective intelligence of an enterprise to, for either good or evil, you know, depending on who you are and what you're trying to do. Mm. Um, then, then Enterprise 3.0, to me, is really driving context and insight on top of that. Mm -hmm. okay. So the, the example would be, um, so, so I'll, I'll use one of my, my standard use cases. Um, so we have a... We have a common problem that is in, in large enterprises. I saw it in my last company and last uh, job. And it, it's, it's exactly the same at AMD. Um, we have development teams that are just littered all over the globe. Um, they do not share languages, uh, although the, you know, we all, especially Texans, bastardize the English language. Um, we don't share time zones. Um, we don't share cultures. And yet we have to work together, and we have to work real time. It's 24-7. It's always on. And so we've been using um, what are now an absolutely rich set of tools compared to where we were five years ago to drive uh, collaboration a completely different way. Give us a couple for instances. So, so we have a, we've been working with a, a startup um, called uh, Hiveworks, very small um, enterprise 2.0 company. And they've given all the development teams, so the teams in Malaysia, um, the teams south of Texas, and then the teams in Texas, um, the ability to collaborate and work together using kind of methods that are comfortable for them. Yep. So they're, they're leveraging all of the web, web 2.0 sort of constructs yep. and, and techniques using this tool. Great. The thing that's missing, and this is where I think Enterprise 3.0 is going, is what's missing is context. So they, they keep asking, OK, this is great, and I can talk to the guys in Malaysia, and I understand what they're doing, and I can see the documents they're, they're using. But can't you bring the bug tracking system into this conversation so that when we're talking about a bug, the bug is right there? Or can you take this conversation and can you move it into the bug tracking system so that I don't have to go back and forth and I don't lose track of what I'm talking about? And, and in other that, words, that context. That, that the 2.0 environment, the collaboration was divorced from the rest of the enterprise yeah, it's, infrastructure. It, right. It's, it's, it is another silo. Another it's silo. Like, Great. It, it, it happens on its own, and it's not really connected to anything. It's, it's not that it's bad. It's very, very powerful. Yep. Um, but, but it happens, it's its, own, and it, it's its own work stream. And it's not integrated back out to where people are actually working. And, and where I think Enterprise 3.0 becomes very powerful, and this is where, and I could be dead wrong, but I think search is the key enabler, is where it becomes more of a push, where a machine is deriving insight and sending it back into the conversation okay. and saying, OK, I can see the conversation. I can see the level of expertise of all the participants. And I think this is relevant data to this conversation. 
Okay. Does, can we get one of our other panelists to respond to the data warehousing query there? Again, why is this not just, they, why is they had a data warehousing different than what we're talking about here? Uh, I can add to it, and I, I, I agree with you. I, I do think it is one giant BI, business intelligence science project. And when, mm -hmm. when you think about it, because you're trying to figure out a way to aggregate related meaningful data in a way that's user friendly and, and very powerful and intuitive. And, uh, and you know, one thing that Ralph was saying was the ability to connect or mash together some of those organ pipes up there. And part of doing that is enriching that content. When you do something with it, you enrich the content. So we have to make it also easy that when that user finds that data they, and it comes out of your uh, customer service system, they can easily enrich that, add their comments, add whatever their thoughts are, and then socialize that with the rest of the organization. And those are some of the things that I find that are missing in the solutions today. It's, it's not easy for the user to get perspective it's not easy for the user to learn from the activities of the, all, all the other people in the organization or in, in the world and, and then uh, you know, push forward their thoughts on it. So capture all of the insights of, of everyone. And, and that's kind of what we're trying to do with our solution. And I don't mean to be selling here at all, but I think the real value is that we want information that enables us so that we don't have to start from scratch every time we start something. So that if, if your customer service rep is working on an issue, they should know that that's been worked on a million times before and 500 of your users found this information useful and they linked it to other things, knowledge articles perhaps. And you can click on that knowledge article and you can find all of the other um, contextual information related to that and use it in a meaningful way. So I think enriching information is another important thing that we shouldn't overlook. But Greg talked about being able to find the relevant information and bring it into the, into the conversation. I think that's, that's exactly um, to this point that, to, that we're accustomed to systems where the bug tracking data is locked up inside this bug tracking system. Right. And there's a bug tracking user interface that is the only way you can get to the bug tracking data. Yep. And, yep. and that's, that's the bug. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. That is the bug. The, the, the data ought to be exposed. Um, so yes, the bug tracking user interface uh, is, is perhaps the common way to get to it. But when, when, when some of the, one of these serendipitous ideas comes along, there's the, the, the raw data is accessible and the raw data can be pulled into a conversation in a, in a different re representation, different presentation. It's also important, by the way, and one of the, one of the things that's um, new about the semantic web or the linked data web is that we're not just talking about the, 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 the kind of the raw data itself. We're talking about uh, the provenance of the data, uh, you know, the calibration of the instruments that collected the data, uh, you know, there's all this, so I referred to metadata earlier, but there's all this other context around it which helps when, uh, so, so um, uh, Gene talked about uh, making different kinds of analyses, knowing whether the data was used in a way that was appropriate for the analysis, uh, you need to track all that, all that provenance. So being able, having generic mechanisms that allows all this contextual information around the raw data itself uh, is 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 part of what will be in uh, in these new in these new enterprises these new these new web web threes. That, that, that kind of sounds like a hell of a lot of work to me. All well, the calibration and all the all the ex ante work you have to do before you can start reaping these benefits. That sounds like a long percolation time. No. So I didn't mean to suggest that you had to do all this up front. Uh, if you if you if you capture all this data and typically we do. I mean, it, it, uh, pharmaceutical pharmaceutical industry is one of the early adopters of, mm. of, of these um, linked data metaphors. Um, uh, they capture a lot of this data already, but it's not exposed in a in a useful way. Okay. Um, so uh, you don't you don't need to do more work than you're already doing. In fact, one of the principles is that the data you have we we have lots of historic data, there are lots of archives of of, of data and. And it's not tagged with all this contextual information. It's not tagged with uh, data dictionaries. We can go back and we can retrofit that. You can retrofit um, as as necessary as as it becomes important to use that in a in a new analysis. Okay. So. Yeah, and actually, j just on the point of serendipitous data reuse, um, there was a very good example from uh, Renault, the the French car manufacturer, where they actually exposed some of their data, their contextual data, from a, a document management system that they had internally. 
and one of their engineers was tasked with optimizing a business process. And by pulling two sources of data that he'd have never had access to before, he was able to actually op optimize the flow of information within this business process. It took him two days to do this, and it reaps about $4 million a year in savings for the company. So a, a very, very simple thing, just getting the appropriate information into that business process, like, like the bug, getting that context information, having it easily exposed, and, th and then um, optimizing the processes. In any of our existing organizations of, of any decent size, we've all agreed that we've got the, the organ pipe problem up there right now. For us to get to Web 3.0 or the semantic web, do we have to go back and retrofit, at least to some extent, all those existing organ pipes and add some new 3.0 flavored APIs or exposed data exposure mechanisms or something to all of them? It, it seems it, our legacy is really poorly suited for the kind of stuff we're talking about. Well, we're accustomed to applications where the user interface is, is, is yep. the only point of access. Um, and, and I think our, our newer systems, maybe there is a, data, there is a database underneath that. So that do we have we to wait get. for all of our old stuff to die and, and get replaced slowly? And is this a gradual process? Uh, I, I, there will be a piece of that. There will be, be a piece of that. But I think uh, the, the newer systems, you know, we can drill holes in the sides of these pipes. So, yeah. so we, can, you know, we can access data. At, at, we don't have to wait for it to come out the end. We can, we can access it in the middle. Okay. But, um, just, just on that, the, the idea with, with linked data is that you're just trying to expose the data that's there. So you're not trying to get rid of your, your, your legacy systems. You leave it there, and you just t dip in and just pull the information out. Mm -hmm. But they don't want you to do that. They weren't built in the world where, they, where that was a good idea or that was desirable. So we've got to go back and bang them on a little, a little you bit. Do. You do. You have to get the drill out and, and, and make little holes so you can start pulling this information. Flow like off. a little drill or the kind that BP was sinking in the Gulf? <laughs> like how much work are we talking about here? I suppose it depends how big the pipe is. It depends is. how but big the pipe is. And how old. How old is it? Well. But I, I think what's actually important is, is not to think about having to drill a hole in every one of these pipes. Because one of the speakers this morning talked about the fact that we have a lot of useless data in our organizations. Mm. You start off by trying to identify where are the high value, highly reusable data sets that we have. Where is the data that, that will have the most utility to our information workers across the organization? And start making those data sets available. And you can do it in an incremental fashion that, that works in conjunction with your existing IT landscape. So it's not a, a scenario where you need to retrofit everything and have everything connected before this starts to work. Fine. You just start looking for the little bits. Actually, that information is quite useful. My employees would like to be able to get access to that because it can help them optimize processes or it can help them when they're trying to, 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 to sell to clients. I, I, I believe that you can evolve as you go. I, I hate to think that we have to hit the reset button on mm -hmm. almost anything. Maybe just as an IT guy, I'm just terrified of writing big checks for <laughs> re-architecture, restructure, anything. Um, we're, we're actually working with a local Boston company that, uh, Ativio, yeah. is, a, is a search engine. Um, they, they've got a very innovative approach to search. And I really believe that, that search is going to be one of the key enablers for the next step beyond. Okay. Um, and, but they, the point is, they are thinking about it today, and they are working on how do you join together structured and unstructured data okay. into something that is relevant. There is some work that goes into the process, but I think that the, where we're headed is right now, those are, are very much the, the use is built around dashboards and you know, kind of the mashup concept eventually it's going to get much more proactive and we're going to start to see insights filtering out into these workloads in the enterprise. The challenge is those workloads right now, are they're not built in a way that the users can consume these insights. And I think that's what we're working on today. I'll, I'll, I'll give you another, I'll give you a sales example. So, so today um, we have the marketing teams that mine social media data for insights. Yep. So they're using um, a couple different tools to try to figure out sentiment. But they're monitoring the tweet stream and they're what happens on Facebook and the blogosphere and all that stuff. Right, okay. right, exactly. Um, they send reports and you either choose whether you're gonna read a report or not. Um, meanwhile, the sales teams are using SFA technology, you know, really mm. kind of 1990s version SFA technology to, to manage their opportunities and their site visits and their accounts and everything else. It, it's a logical extension to get, um, get the sales teams more focused on 
how am I communicating with, amongst the team up and down the sales hierarchy, then once they, they engage with the tools in a different way and they're engaging with the data a different way, you can start to feed that insight sentiment analysis data in so that if I'm a sales rep and, and I sell to EMC and the tool can see that I have a site visit on Tuesday, yep. you can feed data in that says, hey, EMC just got slammed on its stock, here's what we're seeing, a very quick report that comes out of a search engine. Okay. Uh, I, I don't think that that's too far off, and I don't think it requires drilling holes in tubes or... Or too much retrofitting. Or yeah, anything. there's not a lot of retrofitting. I think it, it just... But it is going to be a gradual process where we rethink the data. I could be wrong, but I think the data is going to mostly live in the data warehouse. Okay. Um, and I think search is what's going to pull it out. In, in fact, uh, you know, much to the dismay or confusion of my own staff, my search engine team is aligned with the data warehouse. They're not aligned with application development, and they're not aligned with marketing. They are part of the data warehouse. Could one of you all help me understand the difference between the, the new world of mashups and the old world of system integration efforts? To me, it's the UI, right? So the mashups were, were born out of, a, in my mind, or what I saw was, it was born out of a different way of engaging with content and data, where system integration is it truly is just plumbing. It's just e EAI, you know, putting in message buses yep. and trying to figure out how to integrate um, systems together. Uh, you know, and in the end, a lot of times, the legacy data, what we really do is we just pull it out into a data warehouse and it sits there and nobody knows it's there. And, you know, maybe it dies on the vine or maybe we attach it together. The reason I ask is because when you just describe the effort to take some of the results from the sentiment analysis, application and feed them into the SFA application, it kind of sounded like just a good old-fashioned systems integration effort, no? The, the, the difference is the intelligence. The diff and that's where, whether it's a search vendor like a Tivio or it's something else, um, the, the difference is something has to do the analysis that says, this is how I'm interpreting this sentiment and how I attach it to this conversation okay. or this expertise. Because that is not uh, something, if I gave that to an, a middleware team, they would have no idea what I was talking about. Okay. But it, w when you have the tools and technology that says, okay, I understand sales hierarchies, so I know the difference between an account manager, a regional VP, and a technical sales rep. I understand the conversations that are happening, and I can tie that back to either sentiment analysis or external data that I'm pulling into a repository that I can act against, and now I'm going to push that data back out so that the correct actors see the correct data and see the correct conversations. So a big difference uh, is in enabling the users to do these kinds of data combinations. So a systems integration is something that an IT department does, and okay. it's a big project. Um, a mashup, or in the new linked data world, when we have the tools are fully available to us, a user has an analysis that they want to perform, and, and the web is, is the data warehouse. And, and the web clearly didn't go through a big systems integration process, <laughs> okay? Yep. So, so the user will be able to go and, and, and produce a, a unique mashup uh, for the particular problem, particular question they're trying to, to answer. So, so, so uh, the evolution is, is making it possible for the users to accomplish these these things themselves. I, I think just, just one point here on, on the idea that like linked data technology and data warehouses are, are, are mutually exclusive. They're not at all. I, I think like data warehouses are, are great things. You need them. You need them to be able to analyze your data, to be able to gain insight into your data. But one of the big challenges with a data warehouse is, is getting information into it. Oh, so you have these big ETL projects, extract, transform, and load. And I, I'd imagine your, your, your data warehouse team spend their entire time running around effectively drilling holes into each of these pipes to, to get that information out. So uh, what we're talking about with linked data is that, well, if you, if you look at the, the web, you know, you don't need to do this for documents. You can quite easily pull all that information mm -hmm. together. What we're talking about is, is to use that 
for data so you can have a standard way of being able to pull all of that information into your data warehouse so it, it's done on a more timely basis mm -hmm. and that you're not waiting for, for every maybe 30 days for you to do a large ETL into your data warehouse. Let's do, let's do this more instantaneously. When we buy a new company or when we buy a new piece of technology, if it supports linked data, it can instantly connect into our data warehouse. We don't have to get a team together, let's get a large budget, let's you know, create another ETL to pull this information right. in. So it's trying to move from this point to point integration from, from technology A to technology B. To, to a more uni unifying uh, mechanism to be able to access and pull that data into the warehouse. So that they are very complementary. Are, are we sure that we're not making the classic geek mistake of assuming that normal people want to monkey around with code? Writing a spreadsheet isn't monkeying around with yeah. code. And, and are, are we confident that, that, let's stick with this mashup, because it's the word that I hear a lot, that we're going to get mashing up disparate data streams down so simple that spreadsheet users can actually do it? Well, that's, that's certainly the vision. That's, that's the vision part. I understand that's and, and, the vision. And there are companies, there's a local company here in Cambridge that does, in fact, have a spreadsheet user interface to the linked data web. So for those people for whom spreadsheets are a comfortable way to deal with this data, that's already achievable today. I, I, I think it's a great question. In the enterprise, Thank I you. Gotta, I was particularly proud of it. I, I got to <laughs> believe the answer is no. We, we, in, in the enterprise, it's, you know, where's the button that I hit, and I get everything I want once I hit the button. There's no, you're never going to have salespeople coding, at least I don't. I Are we ever going to get to meet them? Do you think we're going to get to the point where we have salespeople mashing stuff up in their ample free time? I, I, I really, I think the farthest that, that we can hope, at least in the near, near term, is I will download something to my mobile device, and, and that's the extent of it. They're not going to go in and restructure their UI the way that they see fit or anything like that. I don't think that they're going to be building mashups. Um, you know, it, it would be different in maybe a product development space. But yep. in, in most of the workloads, certainly in finance, uh, I don't see anything well, like that happening. Let's be careful about the broad generalization. I mean, certainly, you know, the 90% case is people are going to have a button to push for yep. whatever their particular role is in the organization. But, but what we want to do is enable that 10% case where the lead salesperson or the lead, the lead analyst says, you know, I really wish I could do the following kind of test. Okay. Let, me, let me try it for a morning and see what happens. But and the, then that person enables all the rest of his colleagues. But this is yeah. interesting. So you, I'm hearing a much more kind of circumspect vision than I've heard from the Web 3.0 or the semantic web crowd for a while. And what you're articulating is, like you say, a vision where we can get these, um, th these data, we can get the data exposed and get this ability into the hands of the 10% of the organization that's going to react to it. The, I've heard previous versions that kind of assumes that 100% of the organization just wants to go taking disparate data streams and mashing them together and generating business insight as a result. And that strikes me as, as a little optimistic about I'm taking nothing away from our workers, but you know, I don't want to do that in my spare time. So, so the, a trap we, uh, well, I say a trap, it was, uh, an, uh, the evolution um, is that when, a, when a, a, a user had a particular problem they wanted to solve, you know, 10 years ago they had to write a request to the ID department yep. to get the particular report generated that they wanted to solve. And then you know, days or weeks or months later, they would get that report back, and then it wouldn't be quite what they wanted, and they'd tweak it, and there'd be this cycle going around. Okay, so we need to shorten that cycle. And there's nobody better to, to figure out how to tweak that thing than the user himself. So, so the progression of this technology is, is to, to shorten that cycle so it's all up here, and not, and not between yeah. um, an IT specialist and, and the user who's trying to who's trying to use that data. Yeah, and I agree. If it's easy enough for the, the power user to start using it, you'll see it permeate through organizations, and maybe it'll grow from 10% to 15 to 20. Will it get to 98? Probably never. But if, if, it's, if it's something that's very simple for an end user to do, just to mash data together, a salesperson saying, I'm going on a sales call. I have five emails here. I want to link that to um, uh, the company data that I'm calling on. I, I want to get the emails, and I want to put them all in one place and link them all together so I have one source to go to. I think a salesperson would do that. Or would they say, I want you to do that for me? 
uh, well, based on all of the salespeople that I've worked with, that would be their first answer. Uh, but if, they, if that answer is like, no, you, we, we're going to give you a tool to do it yourself, you're confident that somewhere down the road, more and more of our salespeople will say, yeah, okay. I well, be, be, well I, I've worked with a lot of sales teams, and they, they really want access to data, and they want it easy. That, that's all they want, they want to know, and they want to know that I can go to one place and find it. And if they have to build that one place by dragging a little bit of information, yep. then I, I think they'd be willing to do it. Well, I hope all of us have, have, have hired some power users. So they'll lead, they'll lead the rest of the colleagues. And, yeah. and you know, the organizations who, who will have the biggest... Uh, but this is kind of the revenge of not necessarily the nerd, because that was the old IT department days, but the revenge of the power user. What, what I'm hearing you all talk about is giving them just a turbocharged set of tools to do the stuff they've always wanted Un to do. Unlocking the data so that they can get to it. Let me ask one last question of you all, and then I would love to throw it open to hear what the audience wants to talk about. Uh, I, Ralph, I want to go back to something you said, which is that the, this, this revolution has been at hand for about a dozen years now, and, I, and, I've, and I've been following the, the conversation for about that long, and it always seems like we're just about to turn the corner and get there toward this, this vision of a more uh, data-enriched, empowered, interconnected workforce. Can I get your thoughts on, on why, we, why it hasn't happened yet and why you're confident that it's about to happen finally soon? Well, it mostly, it, I mean, it takes longer than, than, than those of us who are start at the research end think it is going to take. But, uh, but, but we, make, uh, we make measurable progress. Uh, I think uh, we have examples. One of the things that the, uh, that the World Wide Web Consortium uh, is, is working with uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Yep. Um, and they, you know, they have the silo problem in spades, and they, but they realize, and they have some, some, some uh, visionary folk in some parts of the, that, th that industry who recognize that between the four or five different scientific disciplines in their companies, uh, if they could combine data across those disciplines, they actually know facts that they didn't realize they know that they knew, and, and so those, those um, uh, 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 opening up that data and representing it in forms that it can be combined together uh, is, uh, uh, is, is an active project underway in, in those industries, so. Okay. Other thoughts on, on why the revolution might finally be at hand? I think it, it, it's, it's happening right now. The, the challenge that, that we have is that data and interpreting data is just inherently complex. And most people just really don't want to do it or, or just misinterpret the data. Mm. And I mean, to your point about enabling power users and then letting those power users be the lighthouse for the organization, it's absolutely dead on. What we haven't figured out is how to do that transferal. We're only now grasping how to do it in using common BI techniques. Right. You know, so the, the concept of self-service BI has been a holy grail now for how long? And yep. it's only now really starting to see the light of day in reality versus in PowerPoint. And <laughs> we're seeing the same thing in the trans, transition from Enterprise 2.0 to 3.0. This, some of this stuff is going to be hard. And until we connect those power users to really the true adoption, the successful adoption curve of how are the 90% going to actually interpret and use this data, where is the red button? That they can hit the button and the data comes out and it came from a power user. I don't, I, it's challenging. I, I guess that's a long-winded way of saying, man, it's hard. <laughs> Making slow progress because it's a really hard problem. It's really problem. hard, yeah. yeah. I think when you look at the um, participation pattern in the original web, we started off, first of all, with scientists sharing data and, and then their information, and then moved on to uh, the government started sharing their data, and then the businesses came along, things like Amazon and Yahoo. And if we're looking at the, the web of data today, what we had is initially started off with the scientists. They started sharing their data. Mm -hmm. Then the governments have started sharing their data. We had a speaker t this morning talking about data.gov, which yep. is the US government's yep. initiative to share their data. Um, We've got uh, data.uk.gov, which is the British government's initiative to share their data. The European Union is trying to share their data. So the, the, the next step then is, is companies starting to share their data on the web. And what you're seeing is you've got companies. You're telling me that the private sector is lagging the public sector in this regard? Well, well there, there is a, a fairly um, 
uh, well recognized adoption pattern for the web of documents that has now been replicated again with the web of data. Now, these things happen very quickly. We're talking of periods of two to three years, but we are seeing companies now like the New York Times publishing their data. Best Buy pu publish all their product data on the web. Um, you get Thomas Reuters, the BBC, CNET, the World Bank. All of these organizations are starting to make their data available, and that's the first step to make your data available. But also inside their organizations as well, they're starting to make their data available as well. I think the New York Times is a very interesting example of that, where they, where they publish their data. They're uh, an organization that has curated data for over 100 years. They know their business, and they use it effectively externally and internally within their organization. Yeah, I would actually say I don't think we're moving that slowly. I think we're moving pretty rapidly, as a matter of fact. You mentioned the Internet's 20 years old now. The web. Oh, but the web's 20 the now. Well, I was at BBN, so, <laughs> so I remember. Uh, I was at BBN using the Internet back in the early 80s, as a matter of fact, to tell you what a dinosaur I am. Uh, but I think we are moving very, very, very quickly. So mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years ago, you didn't transact commerce over the web. So there wasn't all of that wealth of information. Uh, six years ago, you didn't talk about social networks, really. So we're, we're really moving at light speed. And, and I think in, in the corporate world, we're, we're really trying to catch up. Now we have this wealth of data, wealth okay. of applications. The term CRM was really coined in the 90s. And it didn't exist before then. There was some Salesforce automation before that. But so we're getting data from a lot of different places right now. And what we're learning is that that data is very valuable. And it's even more valuable when it's connected and it's easy to access. So I think we're just getting there where this this big mountain of information is available, and we have to figure out how to slice and dice it, use it in a way that's very productive for our organization. So I think we're moving pretty fast myself. Yeah. Actually, Ed, Ed made a good point that uh, I tend to focus on what's on the public web. You know, that's, that's what's of interest to me. But, but internally, um, you can have internal webs where you don't have all the, the, the privacy, sort of business value, same, con same concerns. So, there, some of the early adopters of, of our semantic web technology were just internal uh, systems that that, yep. you know, that that we couldn't talk about. Well, that, you know, they didn't want to talk about it. It was their their business value internally in their company. So. Got it. Let's throw this open. Could you start us off? Uh, uh, my name is Luis Romer. Uh, I'm a Web 2.0 enthusiast. So we know that Web 2.0 wasn't born with the organization in mind but was so highly used and so easy to use that eventually it became Enterprise 2.0. So how do we see the Web 3.0 being used by the general population, how that, in, how that can uh, uh, help to adopt quickly? Well, I think the same power of connected information applies to consumers as it does to uh, corporate America, for example. Um, I know I'm on the web every day, and I'm doing searches every day. And if, if, if anyone here is like me, uh, I'll do a search today, and later in the day, I'll think about it again. And I'll, I'll go back, and I'll look for the same information, and I'll forget the search term I used. So I'll spend twice as much time looking for it the second time. Uh, but boy, wouldn't it be nice if I could have somehow easily captured that information and linked it to whatever content was important to me so I could come back to it later and just continue to enrich my experience with it. So I think it's equally important to the consumer, and I think you'll see dramatic changes there. And it might even lead before Enterprise 3.0, just as Web 2.0 led Enterprise 2.0. Anyone else want to dive in on that? I would say you know, the short answer is we'll, we'll have to figure it out. You know, what, in the, the Web 2.0 uh, or the read-write you know, functionality of Web 2.0, it didn't translate perfectly into the enterprise. There's a lot of nuances that um, just don't make sense. My, my favorite example that I've, I've used is, is the follow button. Right, so following makes a lot of sense on Twitter, and it makes a lot of sense on Facebook. But inside the enterprise, it has very, very opposite uh, context or meaning. Right, if, so if um, in, in the developer, so I'm a member of the developer community, and there's developers all over the world. If I were to follow an individual college grad software developer in Malaysia, I don't know how he would react. Because, okay, he might react, who is this guy? Why would he follow me? And get very <laughs> nervous. If I'm the VP of HR, it's even worse. Now it's like, okay, what did I say? What did I do wrong? So those, <coughs> I think as this evolves, what, you, what we'll see is we'll see very, very interesting use cases and technologies and companies out in Web3.0. Web 
And I think it's going to lead. I think the enterprises will lag what's happening in, in the web, and then we'll just pick up what makes the most sense and is the most relevant, and things that we can translate in. And, and I think that's okay. I think it's a natural part of the progress, process. You know, we, we need this experimentation. We need, if we think about um, uh, the, the interactive applications that, that were, were Web 2.0, uh, not all of those are appropriate for, for enterprise use. But, but they lead to ideas about how to adapt them to enterprise use. So uh, in some cases, we're, we're, we're forced to participate in all the new communication mechanisms, all the new social media, um, because we don't know which one will win, ultimately. And we need to keep in touch yeah. with our customers. And we need to know what our customers think. Uh, so we have to make sure we're watching Twitter and all these things. But, but what concerns me about some of these is um, uh, it's our data, and we shouldn't be giving our data to outside services unless there's some, you know, some risk analysis there. So I don't know anybody. Anybody remember GeoCities? Right. We put a lot of data off there, and then it disappeared. And but it was our data. So so you know, let's not you know let's learn from those kind of lessons too. Yeah. But but think about the metaphors of of uh, the kinds of things that the interactive. Uh, uh, applications of the web did, and now we're adapting those to what makes business sense. We'll do this, the same thing will happen with, with the data web. There'll be lots of experimentation out there. We'll develop some ideas that then we'll figure out how to use in an in a, in a enterprise way. Please. Hey, uh, short question. When we think about Enterprise 3.0 as adding context to what Enterprise 2.0 brought us, which is the amalgamation of data, uh, we tend to see Salesforce and the like as poster child for Enterprise 2.0 or, or, or the killer application. You see Google Wave with its federated security model, the fact that you can put your own instance of Google Wave, the fact that you can develop your own uh, widgets to interpret and put the context, and the fact that you can even collaborate in real time and transform collaboration to documents. Do you see that application as kind of a poster child for Enterprise 3.0? Is Google Wave the, the wave of the future? Is it, is it showing us how well, things are going to go? It does reflect a lot of what you've been saying about adding context, securing the information, the, 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 like crossing the, the boundaries between chatting and documentation and back and forth. It seems to be a good demonstration of what we're trying to say here. It's, it, it's a good use case, but um, you know, not to say that it's not an excellent tool, but um, security is and the concerns around security are just not going to go away. Um, and so I, I struggle with um, when you get into heavy IP situations, how any SaaS vendor can, can really get over the hurdle, the security hurdle. I, I'm, I struggle with it all the time. And I, Google is, is one of those. So where the collaboration is, is really less IP heavy, it's an absolutely excellent tool where it becomes very, very IP heavy or sensitive. There's stuff um, you just don't want to have leave your firewall. There's just yeah. stuff that but I Google just can't imagine so, it getting out beyond the firewall. But I, I wouldn't want to get too hung up on the implementation. I think you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very, very much interested in that sort of collaborative application, the whole data, the fully data intensive, data integrative, um, collaborative uh, environment there. I, I think that's uh, it's, it's the closest. You know, I, uh, it's, it's the closest I've seen to, 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 uh, to division a lot of people here at MIT and elsewhere have been working on to, to a collaborative environment. But, but yeah, so there's some issues with the implementation. And, um, uh, and, and I'm concerned about whether I'll have access to my raw data later but Google in, in other ways. Google that they will make the technology offer to install in your right. own premises. So, so it's important, and, and so you know, my corporate sales pitch is it's important that these, that these thing, sorts of things be built on open standards so that, so that I can combine data from that environment with data from another environment yeah. and, um, uh, and, and perhaps extract the data back out if somebody else comes up with a, a yeah, more yeah. interesting user interface for, that, that, for, but the, for the same collaborative environment. So, okay. yeah, but I think it's a very interesting kind of metaphor that we should yeah, look at. Hi, uh, my name is Sanjeev. I work for a publishing company, but I'm also the co-founder of a company called DataLed, which is a marketplace for structured data. 
Um, what we have been doing is we have, we're actually working on what you refer to as linked data. So think of us as you know, a marketplace for data.gov or data.co.uk. The question I had was, it's, it's really a big problem for us to, to you know, connect all these disparate data sources. Let's just take data.gov you know, and link them, because there is absolutely no standard whatsoever. Uh, good news is Wikipedia has solved it to a large extent. The beauty they had was a large community. My question to you guys is, you know, do you see this concept of semantic web being adopted by publishers on the web, a large majority of publishers on the web, anytime soon? Or do you think the approach to tackling this problem of linked data to say data.gov and creating, uh, you know, creating interpretations or uh, you know, analysis out of that should be done by taking small baby steps rather than saying, oh, let's just solve linked data for data.gov. Um, do we take baby steps by saying, let's just solve it for time series or for a particular sector or something small? So we'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, we, sh we should take as large a step as we're able to take. Right, okay. we did and we <laughs> but, failed in but, that. But, but we can't boil the ocean, right. okay? So uh, data.gov is a number of things, and, and it's, a very, it's a very important expression of giving people access to the data they own, uh, but, you're, but you're correct. The, the next, the, the, uh, a step I hope will come soon is that uh, the data formats that data is published on data.gov are, are more standardized. And um, you know, so, so having access to the raw data files uh, in, in whatever form they're in is is important first step. And, and I hope it won't take too long before the, the uh, semantic information is also available uh, through those same sources. So uh, there, there's a variety of ways to do that. And you know, we don't have time this afternoon to get into all of it. But I think it will come in, 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 in small-ish steps. Thank you. I want to get back to integration. I think um, I'm sorry, Kevin Osborne from Name Media. Um, more and more, we use more of these software as a services things and things like that. And I think that uh, Dr. Curry is saying that like this, the leaders in this are, are the scientific community, but they have a shared interest in sharing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the different vendors who are who have come up with their own clever version of a particular service. They're not so interested in sharing. And so uh, the best I've been able to do in my company is to look for you know, vendors that actually have an API or something so I don't have to web scrape. And, and so, uh, uh, I mean, how can we, you know, as, a, as business communities, uh, create a value for sharing and for standards, which seems to have, um, I, mean, it's, it's, I mean, there was more interest in standards in the, in the 80s, I think, than there is now. I think, uh, I think uh, there are a few er isolated areas, but uh, how, how can we get that to be uh, uh, more in our favor? Because it will ease the, these, these kind of integrations that you're talking about. Yeah, to, yeah to, to what extent does the stuff that we're talking about relying, rely on standard setting, keeping in mind that standard is the only one word oxymoron in the English language? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose there, there's two sets of standards that you need to look at. One is the, the technological standard for, for communicating data, so that you need to have one universal access method to be able to pull and communicate data. So for the web of documents, we have HTTP. It's a very, very simple standard that just allows you to get that data. Linked data technologies effectively provide that standard for you for, for data. The second issue then becomes, well, what is the data talking about? And if I want to share data between two people, we need to agree about what, what the concepts we're talking about, what do they mean? Um, one thing that I, I've, I've also looked into is this notion of pre-competitive collaboration within industries where they, they come together to agree on, on a common set of principles or a common set of concepts that is universal across all members. Um, this is very pre-competitive collaboration like this within the pharma space is quite advanced. They have um, things like Pistoria where effectively you're getting the large multinational players such as Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, they're coming together to say, we've got a lot of data that's pre-competitive, that's of no use to us whatsoever. Can we just come together to agree on how we can integrate this data 
and then we can take that data in-house and then we can start to compete together on, on this level playing field. It, it, it's very interesting from a point of view of it makes our internal systems better, but it also creates a marketplace for other vendors to come in to start offering products and services on top of those data standards. So in effect, you're trying to, you're, you're trying to come together as an industry to define what the, what the tracks are, what the, rail, what the railway lines look like, so that you can then provide product offerings on top of that. But one thing that I've noticed is that even when the people come together in a spirit of goodwill, that conversation about what's the standard can take an amazingly long time and proceed at some kind of glacial pace. I heard an anecdote. I was talking with some healthcare IT people a while back, and there was someone who um, worked for a great big health provider in the state of California, and they said, yeah, our information systems have five codes for gender. <laughs> what? And the other one said, I thought there were only two. Well, and if those people are going to get together and share information, they've got to have a very detailed conversation about how those codes map from five down to two. And th th these conversations kind of drag on for months and years. And meanwhile, people just slap data together using Excel and go do their jobs. How, how are we going to get out of that situation? Yeah, so you, what you've got there is a, a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. So in, in the top-down approach, you're talking about getting committees together, everyone trying to trash out around a table what um, how many genders there are, okay? That's achievable, you can do that, but the reality is is that as soon as you get agreement, someone else will walk in the room and say, I've just discovered a new gender, hold on, you need to change everything. Mm -hmm. So the other way you can try to do it is bottom up with a grassroots effort to effectively get smaller communities together to agree on what is common between their, between their, um, their, their different communities. You don't need full agreement. If you can just identify where you do agree, and then incrementally try and grow that so that you don't need to have a big bang approach to say we need to agree on everything before you can communicate. But if we can at least agree on, well, we've got male, female, and other, or something like that, we, all, all disagreement can go into the third category, but we do agree that we have, we have two, okay. two, two genders. Sir. But there's got to be a chance that we will see the, the Walmart effect, and I apologize to Ben Hassan, but he's in a different room, so he's not going to be mad at me. Um, but if you think of the extended enterprise as a connection of enterprises, partners, customers, at some point, it's, it's the biggest person or enterprise in the room that sets the standard. And that's going to work a whole lot faster and seamlessly than trying to set standards through a governing body and trying to go through an evaluation process. You know, in, in, in our industry, um, if, so I, we have a big customer HP, for instance, if, if we want to extend our enterprise to HP, we're going to be much more receptive to how do you, HP, tell us how you want to do this than the other way around, because they're just so much bigger than we are, and they're our customer. Yep. And, and I think that, that kind of dynamic has got to be common in enterprises. I think the tools are pretty good now, so it doesn't really matter what standard it is, but the problem is, is, is I think getting companies to agree to be open and, and that's, that's, I think that's, that's, that's the part that I really struggle with a lot. Like, I think some, someone up there mentioned, you know, just, you know, how can we make sure that we can get our data back? Because you know, sometimes it's data that we're pulling, that they're performing some service for us, but sometimes we're putting our data out there, and we can't necessarily know that we'll get it back, so. There's different levels of standards, too. I think uh, one thing that has held, hold, um, has held up a lot of the integration work over the past you know, three decades is, uh, a focus on trying to define the one true schema, the one true data ontology. And, 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 and that's a, perhaps a Sisyphean task. But, but so, so we're backing off from that, saying it, it's OK if uh, one jurisdiction wants to say there's five genders, and, and, and I want to uh, mash that together with data from another jurisdiction that only acknowledges three. Well, so, so I, can do, I can produce that mapping from how the five combined with the three to produce the analysis. And, and OK, so that's not novel. We've been able to do those mappings before. But, but a new feature of the linked data web is having done that mapping, now I can publish that for others to use. Okay. Oh, fine. So I can find the mapping that, that, that Ed's done. And, and well, I'll do it for my selfish purposes. I'll then upload it somewhere. And if it suits your selfish purposes, you can make use of my work. Mm -hmm. Sure. OK. Please. Yeah, hi. Time for a, uh, two, I'm sorry, how many? This better be a bang-up question. Right. If it's not a bang-up question, you may <laughs> yield the floor. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Okay. Uh, Tom Huntington, I, I work for a, a SaaS vertical. 
uh, in the last five years we've been doing workflow automation, accumulated a mountain of data uh, with our customers. And uh, we believe it has a lot of value to our customers. Uh, we, we could also collaborate with them, dip into their various silos and, and combine it. Uh, we look at this and we see you know, potentially infinite value for them and us. And we look at it and we see potentially infinite challenges. There are you know, a million reasons why, why this wouldn't work, that wouldn't work. You know, all the stuff that, that goes into the comment you know, Greg made, it's, it's just hard, right? <laughs> So my question for, for you all is, um, who are some of the companies that have you know, sort of made it over these mountains or enabling technologies that are, are helping enterprises get over them? And I'd be interested if you each had you know, one example of either a, a company that's, that's done it or enabling technology that's sort of at the cutting edge of helping, helping us sort of you know, over the mountains. So the, the example I love, and I, I hope I understand your, your question so you can tell me if I'm off base, but uh, the, the one I love is the Netflix prize where you know, they had this wealth of data and they wanted to improve their business process and their technology based on this wealth of data. So they just opened it up and they just gave it to people and said, look, we'll give you the data. You see if you can figure out how to do something with this. Um, I've, I've been challenging our engineering teams. So, so one of the biggest blocks of data in my data warehouse is I have the test data for every AMD processor we've ever made. <laughs> I have no earthly idea what to do with this. Um, but it sure seems like the logical thing to do would be to just give it to, give it to you, give it to HP, give it to anybody, and just say, can you guys figure out anything that you can do with this data because we really, at this point, we don't know. Right. Or we know, but. Mm -hmm. Was that a good example? Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. that's good. Anyone else want to take a crack? Well, so, so we have 330 members of our consortium, so I hate to single out any one of them, but, but I think the, the new things that the, search, the big search engine vendors are doing right now to, to um, not just give you the search results in a presentation that's meant for humans to read, but provide little hooks in there for um, people, people to add their own data. And the data is available in the search results in a way that's machine possible, processable. Both uh, you know, the big search engine vendors are, are, are doing this now, and I think that's a, that's a, that's a key advancement that will, that will, I hope, lead to, lead to some really new cool applications of, of using data um, that's embedded in uh, uh, presentation that was initially meant for human consumption. Right?